let's get started with this week's That Word Chat. Okay, thank you and welcome everybody to that word chat. Thank you, Heather, our uh, producer. And uh, we've expanded the staff this week. We've got uh, Aaron Brenner is now our assistant producer. Um, and uh, our theme music is by James Allen, the wonderful composer from Cincinnati. No relation, my son. Uh, and uh, I'm Mark Allen, your host, and today we have Roy Peter Clark. Um, I'm going to switch to speaker view so I can just see him. And uh, let me let me introduce you, Roy. Um, you are a senior scholar at the Pointer Institute, and I'm going to ask you what that means. I know you're a senior, senior scholar. You're retired now, so I imagine, um, but I think you were a senior scholar before you were retired. So, uh, <laughs> So uh, he, he spent 40 years in teaching writing to all levels. Uh, grade school students, as I've just read, uh, starting out and uh, Pulitzer Prize winners, countless journalists. Um, and according to his, uh, the, the note in his book, I should pull it off the shelf here, uh, Murder Your Darlings, it says you're considered a garage band hero. Sorry, garage band legend. Um, yes, in my own mind. Yeah, yeah. Is I assume that that was you, or has anybody called you a garage band legend? Actually. Um, well, I've been playing in rock bands since the Beatles arrived in America in 1964. <laughs> uh -huh. So I'm, I'm going to give you a little bit now, okay? Just a little. Um, yeah, please. That's a sound. I'm not even looking at the keys. <laughs> they make machines that do that for you, you know. <laughs> Very uh, nice. I will take Very requests. Nice. All right. Now, people ask me always, Mark, why, you know, why do I always have a keyboard handy, a music handy, uh, during workshops and conversations? I said, if you traffic in adverbs and semicolons, you better have an escape hatch. <laughs> so mine happens to be um, uh, music. Uh, but I also see, uh, I think most people understand uh, that all the creative arts have these really interesting intersections. Mm -hmm. uh, so we call a, we call a piece of music a musical composition. Composition is also something we call writing. It's all a, a photograph is composed as composition. So for me, it's very very important. I, I, I don't know when it hit me, but at some point it hit me that if I was going to grow as a writer, I couldn't confine myself to the elements of the writing craft that I needed to kind of have um, other categories of creativity uh, to sort of reach into and learn from. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's my story and I'm sticking to it. All right, so you were, uh, you were playing music. W were you always a writer at the time that 1964 when you were in a band, did you consider yourself a writer at that time? No, no. Uh, I wanted to become, I knew what I wanted to become. I wanted to become a lawyer. So the reason I wanted to become a lawyer, I think in 1964, one of the, one of the, the, where did you get your ideas of what lawyers did? Well, you got them from TV shows. 
And my favorite TV show was Perry Mason. And so I thought that's the way lawyers worked, criminal lawyers, that I'd get you on the stand and I'd break you down and there'd be this dramatic moment. And I just love that. And you never lose a case. Um, <laughs> and Della Street was your helper and friend. It was, it was like perfect. Yeah, sure. And I had a, um, an advisor who said, well, if you want to be a lawyer, when you go to college, Roy, you should become a, an English major. So um, somewhere, I, I don't remember exactly the novel. I think it was a novel, um, I think it, it was a novel I read my senior year in, in, uh, in high school that, that something hit me. I'm, I have a vision of myself being on a beach and reading this fat uh, novel. I think it was Herzog. And um, I said to myself, wow, you know, I, I'm really seeing something in, in this. I'm seeing it in a different way that I've seen it before. I went off to Providence College, a small liberal arts college, and I had these wonderful English teachers, uh, literature teachers. So that's what I decided I wanted to become. And I, got a, uh, I wound up going to graduate school at Stony Brook, where I grew up on Long Island and got a PhD there in 1974 and sent out a hundred letters um, for a hundred uh, academic jobs around the country. And back then you had to type them out individually. You know, um, uh, I got four interviews um, and I got one offer uh, from uh, a branch campus of Auburn University in Montgomery, Alabama. And I spent three years there teaching writing and grammar and literature. And the move from New York um, to Alabama was so culturally challenging uh, in the immediate aftermath of the civil rights movement that I really wanted to write about my experiences there. Uh, and I began to do that, op-ed pieces, essays, um, and uh, someone noticed it, an editor from St. Petersburg, Florida, a great editor named Eugene Patterson, uh, who was, was the editor of the Atlanta Constitution from 1960 to 1968 and had a signed column in the paper every single day. Um, and and um, he created for the American Society of Newspaper Editors what became known as the Writing Coach Movement. Um, and he created uh, the ASNE Writing Awards, and I was supposed to go to St. Pete for one year in 77 to work in the newsroom, and I was supposed to go back to, to Alabama. And that one year has become 43 years. So that's the story mm -hmm. uh, uh -huh. of how I got from um, Perry Mason <laughs> to Jimmy Breslin. I, mean, I, don't, know, I don't know the, you know, the, the landing <laughs> point, but... That, that that makes me um that reminds me that i've i've been telling everybody you have six writing books i don't know where i got the number six is that i think this is your sixth like book purely on writing since uh there's a grammar and glamour was there's one before that uh yeah so the bit the, so uh i had 13 books with my name on it Okay. Um, yeah, I saw that, that you had 19 books, and I remember you had yeah. the book on Eugene Patterson. Right. Uh, so I thought, wait, I've been telling people the wrong thing. Well, it's a, um, um, the, the, the very first book I wrote in the 1980s was called uh, Free to Write, A Journalist Teaches Young Writers. And it was uh, basically, it's something that I've revisited uh, uh, in the last uh, few days, in fact. It was about my adventures as a volunteer teacher in a fifth grade public school classroom here in St. Petersburg, where my daughters went to school. And uh, it occurred to me that it might be fun and interesting to teach reading and writing to elementary school students using some of the strategies that I was learning from journal journalists. So all the kids, for example, got reporters' notebooks, and all the kids learned how to interview. And all the kids um, would write not uh, fictional stories, 
with stories about uh, that they would find around the school, to find in their neighborhoods, to find in their family histories. And um, uh, then there was a series of others, but something really significant happened um, about 12 years ago, which was that uh, I met an agent from New York named Jane Distel. She said no to the first five uh, pro uh, pitches I gave to her. And um, I was about to kind of abandon the whole project. She said, well, what else you got? And I said, well, I've been writing these little, um, my, these little weekly essays for the Pointer website on writing tools. And she said, oh, I, I'm interested in a writing book. And that became the first of the six books that you're talking about. Yeah. All of which were published by Little Brown, uh, Writing Tools being the first one. And there are a uh, quarter of a million copies of Writing Tools in print, um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm delighted to say. Um, and then afterwards, in chronological order, The Glamour of Grammar, my favorite title, if I may say so. Um, a book called, there it is. A shelfie. I'm glad mm -hmm. that's a shelfie. There yeah. you go. Uh -huh. Look at that. Yeah. Look at that gorgeous, yeah. spectacular. Hold that up for just a second, Mark, because what? that's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, that's the that's the that's the sexiest semicolon uh, in uh, in world literature. Look at that. That is a beautiful semicolon. You're right. Then came uh, then came help for writers. Uh, help with an exclamation point, like the Beatles song. Oh, there I am. Right. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the Blue Book, mm -hmm. thank you very much. We go mm -hmm. from uh, from the semicolon to the much maligned exclamation point. Right. Uh, then what followed, What follows is um, how to write short. You may not even have that. I don't have how to write short. Hang on, hang on, don't go away. Okay. We'll be right back, everybody. Here we go. How to write short. How to write short. The great isn't that a, kind of ironic, that. isn't it? Someone said you were kind of like a, a con artist. I said, well, what do you mean? You said, well, you wrote a book about how to write short. Like those two things kind of like don't go together. So um, Would you then what? That up again? Oh, sure. That left, I, I just glanced away and then, um, wow. Oh, I hadn't seen that cover. That's awesome. It, oh, listen, all six of these books were designed by um, Keith Hayes. And there's a special story about, I, I just want to highlight another book. Let's see. This one came next. This is like my return to being an English major. It's called The Art of X-Ray Reading. I don't know if you saw this. It's, uh, I take basically 25 famous um literary texts and kind of uh, look down beneath the surface of the text to try to figure out what the, the authors are doing. So then I heard when I was writing Murder, for, Murder Your Darlings that Keith Hayes had moved from Little Brown to become the art director um, of another publishing company. And I, I, I was just beside myself because, you know, um, he was the man and stuff. So, he heard my wail down in Florida and gave me this cover, which is my favorite of all. And I can't understand how he was able to see that dagger in the nib of that fountain pen. You know, uh -huh. that, that's kind of like a, we have the Dolly Museum down here in St. Pete. And that's, that's one of those, those things. So, he gets the first credit in the acknowledgments. And as I always say to everybody who picks up on my books, please judge my book by its cover. And um, there you are. That's how we got to 19. I got an idea maybe for one more, but got interrupted by a pandemic, although maybe it'll give me the opportunity to, um, um, to find, uh, it is, I think, giving me the idea to, to find an idea that I want to pursue for the book. Hmm. So uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about this book or would that be 
jinxing well, it or no no i won't not jinxing it at all i mean um what happened i had an experience early on this in the 1980s where um I was going around as a young writing coach um holding up the stories that were winning awards were winning as and e awards and and Pulitzer Prizes and Ernie Pyle Awards. And these were, th these were amazing narratives. Sometimes back in the day when newspapers had the space, they were multi-part series. Um, they were converted into books. They were about dramatic things like war and famine and disaster. Um, uh, I think we're coming upon Pretty soon, I remember like Mount, you know, the eruption of Mount St. Helens. And there were these big events, and then there were these big stories, and they were winning the big awards. And I was in St. Louis giving a little workshop, and um, someone raised her hand and said, "I appreciate all of these stories, but I have to tell you that I don't get to write those." I cover City Hall. I have to write about zoning boards, uh, uh, tax increases, rate hikes, mm -hmm. um, and I don't. There's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of jargon. There's a lot of municipal alphabet soup, and I'm doing my best. But I'm not sure you've given me anything that I can specifically use to make my writing better. So a friend, a journalism teacher from uh, Canada who passed away recently, a great friend named Stuart Adam, taught at Carleton University. And I read something he wrote. It's actually how I met him. He had a little phrase where he said, um, good writing in journalism is on a spectrum. It's not all the same. And that spectrum extends from the civic to the literary. And uh, the values are, what the writer is trying to create is on one end, civic clarity, and on the other end, um, literary grace or power that comes from storytelling. And so even back then, so I wrote an essay about this that appeared in the American um, American Journalism Review called Making Hard Facts Easy Reading. We had a list of about 20 strategies that I've found writers using to, to, um, to do these kinds of things, such as um, slowing down the pace of information, um, translating jargon, using numbers sparingly, lifting the heavy cargo out of the text and putting it into a graphic, finding the microcosm, the small element that reflects the big element. Um, so uh, those are things that, um, th those strategies um, are not often appreciated um, for how how hard they are to accomplish because when somebody makes hard facts easy reading it gives the false impression that it's easy to have created that text when really it's just as much the application of craft as uh, a sophisticated narrative mm -hmm. so here we are in the coronavirus right right when i think everybody uh is looking for civic clarity, not just from journalists, but from scientists, from government leaders, you know? Mm -hmm. I've got this mask. I'm, I'm looking at it right now. How do I put it on? When do I put it on? Do I have to clean it? I mean, all of those questions come from it. So, so I think that I can harvest some of the work I've already done, and I think put it in an important new context. And I'm writing on the Pointer website about civic clarity, and it's getting a good run on Twitter and other places. This is right. one of the things that people want to learn.
Right. Yeah. I, I, so I read the the article on the uh, uh, the Surgeon General, just the way he presented the um, the information at the at the yeah. afternoon scrum, um, and I you you gave, you listed some of the uh, techniques for clarity, uh, simplification, not talking down, but simplifying um, repetition of the important things. Um, not a lot of extra speaking directly to people. Uh, mm -hmm. What, as a journalist or as a writer, writing about uh, nonfiction about what's going on in the world right now, what um, you, you you took it from the point of view of a of a public figure um, speaking, and so what does um, what does the writer take from that? So. Um... You know, I think, so if I were to create, if I were, uh, um, I'm just thinking uh, a few days ago, my wife and I, in the middle of the afternoon, stumbled upon um, The Wizard of Oz, which we hadn't watched through in quite some time. Hmm. By the way, you know, there's no place like home. It's right. So that's like sheltering, right? Uh, okay. But the thing that uh, I'm remembering in my mind, one of the the songs by the the cowardly lion is that uh, it, 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 is he talks about if I were the king of the jungle. So if I were the the king of a university or the queen, um, if I were the monarch of a university, I I would. Um, I would try to create a college of a university of writers. And what I would be interested in doing is making all of them bilingual, or maybe it's a, a, a more accurate word is bi-dialectal. What I mean by that is that if I'm an English major, uh, the expectations are going to be that I'm going to learn the dialect of my tribe as an English major. Mm -hmm. I'm going to have a technical language that describes um, uh, language use or uh, literary effects. Um, and listen, if I'm if I'm an uh, economics major, if I'm a ma my my major is biology, mathematics, uh, history social sciences, any of those, those are technically called sort of the discourse communities, the kind of language clubs in which everybody learns that specialized language if you want to join the tribe, okay? But look, there are days when the doctor, the scientist, is going to be called into the public sphere in order to help a community or a nation deal with a crisis like an epidemic or a pandemic and that person needs to be able to write an op-ed piece and that person needs to be able to stand up and answer questions from the press and so it seems to me now the, i think the the language tribe that is most uh how should i say most skilled traditionally at speaking and writing that way is the journalist. But I think it applies to all public writers as well. Um, speech writers, uh, people who write um, uh, reports uh, out of companies for public consumption, all of these people, it seems to me, um, have a special opportunity to match, I have in my mind these two interlocking circles of craft and mission and purpose. So civic clarity leads to an act of social responsibility, which is taking responsibility for what readers know and understand. I tell you what, even as I read the daily newspapers in covering the virus, I think they're doing like a fantastic job. Mm -hmm. I want to reach out occasionally and say, why does that paragraph have to be so long? Why can't you, uh, um, why do you have to assume that everybody knows what mitigation means? 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, slow down the pace of information. I'm getting this, I'm not inventing this, I'm getting it from my mentors like the great writing coach Donald Murray. Shorter words, shorter sentences, shorter paragraphs at the points of greatest complexity. Uh -huh. There are several books that I write about in Murder Your Darlings, going back into the 1940s, certainly, where certain writers like Rudolf Flesch and others were trying to, to help people figure out who their audience was, at what level those people were reading, and how we would write specifically to that particular audience. So we should, we haven't really talked about this book yet, and we should, but first I want to ask you a couple of things. Uh, what's the weather like there? I imagine it's- It happens to be one of the most beautiful days of the year. <laughs> and here you are inside. My wife and I, um, so our, our habit is to, it, it's been warm and dry for this time of the year in St. Petersburg. And, um, but it's allowed us uh, a pattern where we sleep a little later than usual. That shortens the day. It's a little, little uh, I'm not being like a pandemic coach, but uh, shortens the day a little bit. So um, um, then we have a nice breakfast. Um, then we go out. And we're usually out for 45 minutes, sometimes a little bit longer. Mostly walking, occasionally driving a mile or so to a place we can walk. And this morning, now we've lived in this house where I'm sitting since 1978. We discovered a park in walking distance from our house that we never knew existed before. I'm, I was writing about it for our local um, 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 website. Um, just could not believe my eyes. It was hidden uh, at the southernmost intersection um, in, um, if you know, St. Petersburg is on the southern end of uh, Pinellas County. It's kind of a peninsula, mm -hmm. right at the end where Tampa Bay and the Gulf of Mexico looks out. And here was a secret garden. By the way, this is uh, it's very interesting how house arrest, if I may call it that, has, uh, I don't know, clarified my vision a little bit. Um, I'm seeing stories hiding in places where I didn't see them before, hmm. right in closets and crawl spaces and sheds and, and at my backyard and sitting on my front porch. And some of them are related to nature, what nature is doing. Some of them is related to the people who, are, who continue to work. When most people are out of work, mm -hmm. and it has to do a lot with people's new definitions of, uh, of neighborliness. Now, in fact, I wrote a poem, um, a sonnet, which I want to beg uh, you if I can read it. Um, oh, I, I, I have on my list of things to ask oh, you sorry. is whether you could read your oh. poem, House Arrest, you mean, right? <laughs> Okay, well. I'm already uh, ready for it. All right, hang on. All right. Here I am. Ask about now, traditionally, I only write poems if somebody dies or somebody gets married, you know? And okay. The, and the only, the only form I know is the sonnet. I'm just like too immersed in uh, the, the, there's a, a, a chapter on Shakespeare's sonnets in the Art of X-ray reading. So here we are house arrest, and as you'll understand when I'm finished, I needed my wife's gracious permission to publish this. She had veto power, here we go. Yeah. House arrest, St. Pete, Florida, 2020. I feel the pounding beat of house arrest 
a sentence that we serve till who knows when. We do what all our wardens think is best and face a viral ban we hope to bend. We're stuck at home except to take a walk where seagulls croak their freedom overhead. My wife and I, we talk and talk and talk. I think divorce, but that joke's left unsaid. We live in times as fickle as the moon, who grins at us with all his pals, the stars. What month is this? Now April, May, or June? My God, please let them open up the bars. Pandemics are not so, so bad, I think. I hug my toilet paper for a drink. Very nice. Very nice. <laughs> Oh, oh, snaps. I got to get snaps to yeah. Meryl. It's all right. All right. Fantastic. She was a hippie. She was a beatnik back in the day. Oh, Meryl was many things. Back in the day? <laughs> uh, but I want to say, so, so the, I think this is very, very interesting. Um, I, I, I'm going to write a couple of essays about this, about what happens when a journalist, someone who we expect to go out to get stories and bring them back, is, is physically limited. Now, we know we can travel anywhere in the world we want to uh, the way we're doing now. But I think what I'm, what I'm finding in myself I said is just a kind of a, a third eye or a lens in my glasses, my sunglasses maybe, that I didn't know was there. So that I'm noticing things. And first of all, I'm paying closer attention than I did uh, in the past. And I'm noticing things that I haven't noticed before. And I'm finding, for example, a lot of, um, in, in the house, in the yard, just within walking distance, a lot of objects that have stories kind of hiding inside of them, and that these can be um, revealed in interesting ways. And I think what they would do is they would have a twofold effect. One is that they, it would... Um, I think it would frame the art of storytelling under these difficult circumstances. Um, you know, we're not the first authors, Mr. Camus, to have to write during, during a plague, um, mm -hmm. or Daniel Defoe, um, or Samuel Peepus, Peeps, Peepus? Peepus. Peepus. Um, but it seems to me that um, especially at a time when local journalism is under cover, uh, is, is uh, under pressure. Uh, I think it would be a good thing to encourage writers to shed any inhibitions about writing stories from their front porch or their backyard or what they see as they walking around the neighborhood or whatever it happens to be. So I, I've noticed that, and I, I think there's only so much we can do beyond our neighborhood. Um, we don't get out beyond our neighborhood, but we're also, it's, it's a difference of perspective. And I'm finding, uh, I'm finding that same feeling of being very insular. I don't go to Columbus which is three miles to downtown. I, I you, Do you get up to St. Petersburg mm -hmm. at all? Do you go for yeah. drives or, yeah. yeah I don't, I'm, I'm very cautious about this because it's been unclear whether that's a safe thing to do or not. There's been mixed messages uh, about that. So In Florida, there are mixed messages? Yes, there are. <laughs> um, and so Al Tompkins said to me, you should really stay home. You shouldn't drive anywhere. And I said, well, why not? He says, well, it's not that you're going to get the virus sitting in your car with your spouse. It's that you might get into a car accident 
and uh, yeah. you know something will happen. You have to do it. I said, but Al, I can get hit by a car, if somebody else's car, walking you know down uh, to the park, and, and so. Yeah. But 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 all the bathrooms are closed. So Karen that's the trick you have to. Yeah. <laughs> Karen and I <laughs> never drive any place that's far away enough from home for us to get back and use the bathroom if we have to. And that is kind of a, that's our physical limit now, isn't it? That, uh, you know, if you can't, if there's no bathroom waiting for you. My wife and I have talked about, we can drive out 15 minutes, 20 minutes to a park, but then what, you know, then yeah. we have to come back. So. Yeah. Well, it's, isn't it interesting that I, I, I thought, so when we first heard that there was a toilet paper shortage, mm -hmm. I said to Karen, no, I, how many rolls do you think we have? Just, you know, for accounting purposes. And she said, um, I would guess 20. So I said, all right, honey, I'm just gonna go looking around the house, the bathrooms, the closet, the garage, and just see that. And, and there, there was actually toilet paper in all those different loca locations that I had searched. And I brought them all into uh, the spare bedroom. I kind of piled them up into a little pyramid. And it turned out that there were 58 rolls oh. now this was before so we haven't we have not purchased a single no. roll of toilet but we've we've given neighbors we've shared with neighbors <laughs> <laughs> in one case leaving it you know near the front door and everything yeah. you know, because we knew they'd be embarrassed to to ask you know that that famous seinfeld episode can you spare a square um, um but you know this concept it was a really really an interesting story idea like why is there a toilet paper shortage and then it's one of those things when you get into that sort of story mode reporting mode you think about you develop little theories but it became clear that if people are at home if children are at home no one's using the bathroom at work no one's using the bathroom at at school. Um, I'm one of those guys like George Costanza, George Costanza, the, the Seinfeld character who, who knew every public bathroom in, in the city of, of New York, you know, was uh, always a place where you can stop and go. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of like that a little bit in St. Petersburg. So yeah, okay, so there's, there, there'd be like a, a greater demand uh, at home. I think that there are five or six other reasons why that's that's a uh, that's a case. Uh, it'd be really interesting. I think some at some point in the future, um, somebody will write a book, not me. You know, I, I don't want to be called the toilet paper caper. I'm not sure what it what it will be be called, but it will be a story that captures in a microcosm some of the the agonies and and confusions and um, new experiences brought on by the uh, the pandemic. Well, it's it's a great it's certainly symbolic of something we've never had to worry about before. Mm -hmm. And even if even though it seems trivial, it's um, there are some trivial things that we things we take for granted that no longer we can take for granted. So. So the toilet paper uh, maybe is a nice, uh, a nice segue into that story of something yeah, greater. Absolutely. Um, let me ask line. you about. Hmm? Yeah. Go on. Was, was, let me ask you about the. Uh, I no, I always let the guests talk. Go ahead. She wanted to put a uh, period on the sentence and say, uh -huh. uh, "That's that's an example of of a, we talk about that as a microcosm. Right? We could." Uh, yeah, uh, we could talk about this. Uh, if we wanted to write a story about ocean pollution, plastics, we could use this bottle, this plastic bottle of water, as a as a as a microcosm. But let me just say that it extends into other forms of writing, right? I mean, uh, T. S. Eliot um, uh, used took a simple idea, I think, and and used uh, turned it into kind of uh, academic jargon where he said the poet was always looking for the objective correlative which translated simply means 
the object that correlates to the idea or emotion that the poet is trying to express. Hmm. Okay. So back in, um, in 9-11, Jim Dwyer from the New York Times, uh, a writer, that I, a reporter I very much admire, um, was told by an editor, the bigger, the smaller. And by that, he meant, if the story seems too big to cover, look for the smallest thing that has meaning. And in his case, he wrote a series of amazing stories that won an ASME award about a squeegee that belonged to a window, uh, a window washer in the World Trade Center. He and six or seven other people got stuck in an elevator and they used all pieces of the squeegee to break themselves out of the elevator and to get uh, to safety. Hmm. He did a story about a photograph with three children in it that had fluttered from the top of the tower down to the crown and was rescued. And somebody, a, a, a rescue worker who was determined to find out who this belonged to and whether that person was still alive and to return it to the family. Mm. My cousin who was on the 54th floor, Teresa Marino. Um, uh, she escaped. Uh, she walked seven miles. She walked the length of Manhattan. And along the way, somebody gave her a paper cup of water, a stranger, and she drank the water and she saved the cup. So each of those journalistic objects and details were objective correlatives, the objects that correlated. And so in, in the same way, this is the, the toilet, back to that, that toilet yeah. paper, that roll of toilet. Thank okay. you. So what's the, the objective correlative of the snow globes uh, on the shelf behind you? Uh, can you tell us what, uh, you have a collection of snow globes? It looks like a Christmas angel may be there. I will tell you that if you confirm my observation that over your left shoulder is a yellow, yeah, on this on the bookshelf, there's a yellow. Is that the, a little word game there? This is this is uh, this is bananagrams. Bananagram, yeah, that's what I yeah. yeah, yeah. This is this is this is an Aces giveaway. Uh, uh, Aces conference. Um, there's a little lingo five. Providence. Yeah, Pro Providence was it? Yeah, it's, it's, Providence. yeah, of course, it's Providence, right? So, so uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to. We could play. Uh, you know, got my glasses on, and uh, I would take. You know, or say, no, it, it was St. Pete. I take it back. It was St. Pete. Was it? There you go. See, this all the, the, the yin and the yang. But um, so my wife, if you could, so I'm sitting in my converted dining room, essentially, which used to be the living mm -hmm. room. There's a hundred year old piano there. On it is a wonderful sculpture of Santa Claus and a jaunty reindeer. Hmm. And everywhere I look, uh, I see the Christmas ornaments that remain out all year round. And so one of the benefits of this for me, the husband of a spouse who is completely devoted to Christmas, is that I can buy her Christmas presents all year round. Oh. When they're at a low price, by the way. I see. Yeah. <laughs> all right. And I I don't know if you noticed, but I put on my yeah. best Florida, my best St. Pete. I, you know, I spend a lot of time in St. Pete. I'm a member of the, do you get to the shuffleboard club? I, I'm yeah. a member of the St. Pete shuffleboard club. Uh, I just see they're having their annual meeting on Zoom tonight. Which I don't think I'll attend, but uh, I'm very proud of my yeah. St. Pete connections. So I've got, and I got the orange juice. Yeah, the um, millennials really like shuffleboard. So uh... Uh, yeah, I know it's a big Friday night uh, activity there. Uh, yeah. 
Doris Truong and I, I introduced Doris to the uh, St. Pete Shuffleboard Club, and I think she's an active member there. So, she's terrific. Uh, she's absolutely terrific. So now I'm um, in Pelican. Yeah, you, there's you, so you've got some, you, you've got a little bit of an advocacy. I see it's on your hat, and you've got a little bit of an advocacy thing with the Pelican. Yes, and um, so this happened. Um, there's going to be a new pier in St. Petersburg. Uh, I don't know if it'll open up in May, but uh, it's about ready to, to, to open up. 47 acres, I think, is, is uh, the territory, right on there. It looks beautiful from the distance. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the top of the approach, there's going to be an, uh, a sculpture about 20 feet tall of an origami pelican. It's red, mm -hmm. an origami style with two little baby pelicans sitting on the shoulder. Delightful, very whimsical. And when I saw a picture of it in the newspaper, I was in a coffee shop, and I said to my wife, oh my God, they gotta incorporate the poem. And she said, well, what poem? And, uh, and a lady, a stranger next to me, who was a retired <laughs> teacher from Ohio, said, a wonderful bird is a pelican. His bill will hold more than his belican. Okay, now, I've known that poem for a long, long time. People misattribute it to um, Nash. Audrey Nash, who wrote a lot of uh, funny little pelican poems. But it's actually the work of a Tennessee journalist, 100 years old, and it was a, um, a limerick I discovered. And the limerick went, a wonderful bird is the pelican. His bill will hold more than his pelican. He can keep in his beak food enough for a week, but I'm damned if I see how the hell he can. <laughs> and um, as I as I sort of I said, oh, this is it. We gotta. No one comes to St. Petersburg and visits a new pier and sees that thing without knowing that poem and at least going away with the couplet. Um, and this advocacy uh, made me realize that even though. This is the flag of the city. Mm -hmm. That the bird had not been adopted as the official bird of the city of St. Petersburg. Every state has a, uh, an official bird, but um, and some cities do. Mm -hmm. And so I went on this. I wrote stories for the Times about uh, the history of the brown pelican and its folklore and how it's been abused and how it's loved and it's. It's, uh, you know, it's biological uh, heritage. And uh, I get a, a phone call from the mayor of St. Petersburg um, on Christmas Eve saying, uh, ask me if I can be at a the first meeting in January. Thank God this is before <laughs> the coronavirus kicked in. But there uh, I was presented with this beautiful photograph of uh, Pelican and uh, and the city officially proclaimed it. In which case, oh. to take it up a notch, I decided to incorporate the, um, let's see if I have it here. Hang on. Yeah, there you go. So this is my, I'm just going to give you a couple of quick choruses. This is um, the, the St. Pete Pelican song, incorporating oh, the original limerick, and then I'll, I'm going to do a second uh, verse for you. All right. Can you hear that playing? Yes. All right, excellent. Here we go. A wonderful bird is the pelican. Think Jimmy Buffett, okay? <laughs> his bill will hold more than his belly can. He can keep in his beak food enough for a week, but I'm damned if I see how the hell he can. Come on, Meryl, I expect you to be dancing. 
One day I looked up at a clear blue sky. A squadron of birds, they were flying high. And oops, just like that, they all pooped on my hat. I consider myself quite a lucky guy. All right, everybody now, do the chorus. What a wonderful bird is the pelican. We're all on mute, so otherwise we would. That was, that was supposed to be um, performed on my birthday, March 27th, at a, uh, uh, at a, at a gig um, downtown. And it, so it has to wait for another day. But you guys mm -hmm. got to hear like the, the trailer. Yeah. Happy birthday. And how many is that? 72. Really? You never know. You don't, you don't look a day over 71. 71. Um, yeah. So you re you retired from Pointer two or three years ago, but you're still you're still yeah, affiliated I, with Pointer and doing sure. No, I I, I um you know I at a time when at a time when newspaper resources were shrinking and at a time when the Pointer Institute's um, own finances were under stress, um, all boats sink on a low tide. I like to say. And um, it just occurred to me that um, I was old enough and thrifty enough to be able to retire or to change my status is the best, best better way to describe it. Right. And hoping that Pointer could direct its resources uh, not on not on me, but on those. For whom, uh, you know, the future of uh, of the institute, not its uh, its past legacies, hmm. are uh, are represented. Uh, the deal was wonderful. Um, I was able to keep an office right near the library of the institute, a wonderful place. Um, I was able to maintain. Uh, the title of senior scholar, which would on occasion let me speak, um, you know, on behalf of the Institute, if someone called in uh, with an issue or a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a certain amount of contractual work, teaching and writing, that I was able to do uh, for the Institute. Um, I just informed them two days ago that my wife and I had a, a conversation about this. And, uh, and so uh, we decided we're now donating our services uh, to Pointer, um, at least to the, from now to the rest of the year, for any teaching or any writing needs that they may, may have. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's um, so devoted to the place and it's meant so, so much to me and, and, uh, and our family. You know, I say to, there's not as much writing teaching necessarily at Pointer as there used to be. Uh, but um, I try to explain it this way. I feel it's like there are these two existential crises facing journalists. Uh, one is um, the lack of news resources to create great journalism, the, the, the destruction or the deterioration of the the business model, you know, where the money will come from to do great work. No one's been able to, to figure that out over the last uh, couple of decades very well, mm -hmm. except maybe the New York Times or the big news organizations right. like that. The other one is trying to be responsible in, an, in a political era where there are so many forces at work trying to decertify journalism as a practice. Mm -hmm. And so if you look at the work of Pointer now, it's in things like leadership. Um, it's in things like um, uh, creating uh, new digital products. Uh, but it's also in, it's become the, the fact checking the center of the fact-checking world, not just nationally, but internationally. Uh, the people who work for PolitiFact now work for Pointer, not for the Times and the New Yorker. But everybody, when, when, when people at Pointer ask journalists 
the list of things they most want to learn. Good writing for the fourth consecutive decade <laughs> always tops the list. Hmm. So um, uh, that's why um, it's my it's my mission and purpose. I, I had a conversation with um, there's a chapter in my new book about uh, William Zinser's book on writing well. Mm -hmm. And um, I met Zinser when that book was first published and then talked to him. He came to Pointer once and then I talked to him again when he was 91 years old yeah. in his apartment in uh, Manhattan. And I asked him what he was doing. He said he, said he was waiting for his poetry tutor to arrive. Right. Oh my God, you are the man. You know, he's kind of like Les Paul, the great guitar player, uh, when he was 92, was, was working Tuesday nights at the Meridian Club. And when you get to be 72, you start looking for role models who are 91 and 92. Uh, and the last thing he said to me, he passed away within the next six months, he says, let's keep this mission going. You know, and for him, I knew what exactly what he meant was to encourage good writing. Uh, mm -hmm. For journalists, for public writers, for everyone, for citizens, you know, not for just our personal benefit, for the public interest, in the in the in the, in the efforts to create good things, community, democracy, the things that we say we believe. We have gone well over our point of time already, and I haven't opened it up for questions, and I apologize for that. But if there are any questions, if I miss some. Uh, please put, put them in the local chat and we'll call you out and get you to ask them. Um, we're actually fewer people now because once the hour hit, several people have to leave. Uh, but actually, so if anybody has a question, they'd like to just unmute and ask. And I'm, I'd be happy to stay as long as there are questions and as long as uh, the rules allow. Yeah, maybe we should, maybe we should have you back. Um, that word chat because we didn't really get a lot of time to talk about this and what some some of the inspiration and some of the I, I, one of my questions was what are the best tips you know I know it's a book of tips a book of looking at uh, what people have written about the art of writing and and pulling it down to kind of the the nuts of each um, but I was going to mm -hmm. ask you what are your favorites what are your like the ones that really stick with you but I'm not going to ask you that because you know, okay. that would take that would take time away from other people's questions. Okay, Are there, we'll do it next time. Yes, okay. and in uh, 2023, the ACES conference is scheduled for for Columbus. So if you if you can make it, come up to Columbus. I'll bring you up here so you can sign these books uh, right. for me because you know. I don't, as a, as a journalist, then, I, I never like ask people to sign my books, but. No, I'll sign them and you'll sell them on eBay. Yeah. I know how you are. Yeah, yeah, that's the plan, yeah. So are there any uh, questions? Or have we covered everything? All right, what, uh, what haven't we talked about, Lori? Um, so I'll, how about if I, can I give you one surprising thing I learned, one idea I learned from doing uh, Murder Your Darlings? Yes. Just one. It'll be kind of like a microcosm okay. um, for, uh, for the others. And it came from, the, you know, a lot of these books are, uh, are famous. And they they sell in the in the millions or or multi millions. And um, let's see if I can find this very quickly. Okay, all right. So Northrop Fry, F R Y E, was uh, a great Canadian literary scholar who I first read when I was in college. I believe his book was called um, 
the anatomy of criticism. But it, I, I stumbled upon a book about less than two years ago that he wrote called Fables of Identity, Studies in Poetic Mythology. Now, that doesn't sound very practical. The chapter title is called Write for Sequence, Then for Theme. Readers want to know what happens next and also what it all means. And here's just one little paragraph I'm going to read at the top. For as long as there have been stories, authors have played with time, and so can you. We say that life is experienced in chronological order, but that does not take into account dreams or memories. Stories have the power to distract us from daily life and plunge us into narrative time. Our experience of story time differs with each reading. Our first reading is usually sequential a compulsive drive to discover what happens next. At some point, though, our memory takes control. What happens next is replaced by, what does it all mean? Those questions give writers a dual responsibility. We attend to both what happens and what it means. We move from scenic action to matter of themes, myth, archetypes, even news judgment in the term that this movement happens in miniature in um, anecdotal leads followed by uh, nut paragraphs, where we move from what happens in a very, very quick pattern to what it means. When I go see, when I saw um, um, Goldfinger, my first James Bond movie, back in the 1960s for the first time. I thought it was, you know, oh my God, I was so, I was so into it as a, probably a young high school kid. And I was there with my dad. It was so interesting and sexy and exciting and things like that. But when I think about it in retrospect, I lose track of the, of the chronology of the sequence of events. And instead I have these ideas about like, who is this guy, James Bond? How cool is he? What does he stand for? Um, what's his relationship to women uh, and to the government and those kinds of things? So to me, it was really interesting to think of my own work and my own as, as, as having to fulfill not one but two responsibilities, even when I'm storytelling, maybe especially. What happened? so that you can enter into that, you can vicariously experience it, but also set it up in a way that helps you, doesn't determine the way you find meaning, but helps you find the meaning in whatever form that is, is discussed. Okay. So that's one big lesson I learned from, that's one out of 50 writing books described in Murder Your Comics. Yeah, okay. Hi. Thank Hi. you Hi. very much. Um, Show us the sunshine before you. You got the curtain oh. right there. A little, just a little bit. St. Petersburg sunshine. We're, you know, up in the north. We don't get it so much. That's oh yeah. <laughs> that's. Hang on. And that, that's not a. That's it might not be a too much for camera. You. That's how bright it really is. Right? <laughs> Beautiful. That's, uh, that's, right? that's an oak tree. A forty. Uh, it's a. It's an oak tree that my wife planted, and that's. Uh, oh, wow. A happy place for birds and squirrels, to be sure. Excellent. Can you play us out? Sure. What would you like? Anything particular? How about a little? No. I'll, I'll do a little. I'll do a little. A couple of bars of a Beatles song, but only if everybody can. Everybody unmute. <laughs> and, is that possible? And we can ask have, everybody to unmute and sing along. There's a, there's a note that I cannot hit. Right? There's a note I right. can't hit, but everybody right. can help me. Here we go. Ready? Please, the singers, oh. please. She was just 17, you know what I mean, and the way she looks way beyond the bed. I've never danced with another.
thank you. All right. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. We'll be back next week. Great. Call again. <laughs> <laughs>